Welcome to a conversation with the Questrums. Alan and Kelly are a consummate retail couple. Alan's a master retailer and graduate of Boston University with a degree in finance and marketing. And Kelly, Alan's wife and life partner, is an expert on fashion and ardent supporter of the arts and education. The School of Management here was renamed the Questrom School of Business as a result of the Questrom's remarkable transformational gift to Boston University in 2015. I'm Ken Freeman, Allen Question Professor and Dean of the Boston University Questrom School of Business. Allen and Kelly, welcome. Thank you. Nice Let's you. start from the early days. You're a team, a retail power couple. <laughs> How did you meet? Ah, do you want me to tell the true story or do you want to tell the story? It's <laughs> <laughs> so typical. I think I said we were going to have two different stories, right? Well, let's, why don't we like start with yours, version. Alan? Okay, my, she was always trying to get something for nothing because she, she worked for publicity and she wanted to give away prizes. I was a trainee and she'd come down and she'd say, I'd like to have a TV or I'd like to have, I said, for what? I want to give away to these young kids, which is a teen, teen board. They're not going to be my customers. What well, am I going to give them? So I wouldn't give her anything. So you were an assistant buyer I was at assistant Abraham buyer. So she yeah. would then come back and see my boss. Say, oh, fine. Anything you want. <laughs> and I said, what are you giving away stuff like that for? What so she went around you. Went around me. So then, but she then, every, 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 every other day she'd come in, she said, I'd see a cup of coffee on my desk with a little something from, it was a chock full of nuts at the time. Mm -hmm. And He does remember some of the salient facts. So that's how she, she kept trying to pick me up is what she was. Uh. And she claimed she was trying to get gifts. Yeah. So that's the real story. Now tell, you can tell your side of this. Well, <laughs> women were liberated about the time I was go right. going into business. And I was the director of youth marketing at Abraham and Strauss. And I wrote fashion shows and ads, et cetera, all directed toward the youth market. And, and to do a great fashion show and not have a drawing afterwards for the kids to pull and get a boom box or whatever it was they really wanted in those days wasn't quite copacetic. So I knew him. I saw him in the lunchroom, the employee lunchroom, and I thought, wow, what a great looking guy. I think I could kill two birds with one stone. I could get my free boom boxes for the drawing and meet this character. But he would never, ever agree to give me a free door prize. Wow. And I'd say to him, we're going to have 12,000, four shows of 3,000 people at a time, all his market, youth market. And he sold a lot of small electrics. And the youth market is all into that, hair dryers, et cetera. Mm -hmm. He would never do a thing, but if I went to see his buyer, who, who was higher on the learning curve of what it takes to drive business, <laughs> he always gave me whatever I wanted. Then I had to woo him by going to Chalk Full of Nuts and getting his favorite cup of coffee and his favorite pastry and leaving it with no note or anything on his desk. And he quickly figured out who was wooing so who. So perseverance really pays yeah. off. And, she women absolutely pays and she's off. been the boss ever since. And, she, <laughs> and you know how that works out, right? Pardon. I absolutely do. <laughs> and on that topic, uh, uh -huh. you know, marriage, many of us might say that managing a marriage can be more difficult than managing a business in many respects for many people. Mm -hmm. What has been the secret of your wonderful success as a, yeah, a couple? We'll be, we'll be we're going to be married 49 years this uh, September. And, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect marriage. Every marriage needs adjustments on both sides. And I think that uh, what we have been able to do is be able to make those adjustments. And you get into arguments, you get into, you know, really heated arguments. But we've always been able to find why we end up loving each other over a long time. So we were, you know, we've always been, we loved each other and we were also close friends. And so we've, and, and she's been a sounding board to me. Uh, tells me all the things I do wrong, but at the same time, why I'm such a terrific person. <laughs> so that always makes it work better, right? So I think that, I think that's uh, you know, in in terms of, it is uh, it is more difficult than business, and quite frankly, because business, uh, you know, these are people you don't see all the time. And but I think it it does help you to understand that, you know, you have to work out problems with whoever it is, whether it's a business person or not, and you're never always going to agree on every subject. And I think that's the issue, I think, in any, anything is to be able to come together, get the right answer. And it may be a little bit of what you want to do and a little bit of they want to do, and together it's a better answer than by, by itself individually. element of compromise and, and uh, right. in a Absolutely. way, you, uh, knowing said. your customer, too. Right? Your, your customers also of each have other a good anyway. sense of humor. 
<laughs> He's had a sign over his desk for his entire career that says there's no end to what you can achieve if you don't mind who gets the credit. So I let him have all the credit. Yes, right. And it works. <laughs> it Isn't works. That wonderful. Works. Now, education for both of you has been a pivotal for both of you. Mm. Uh, uh, now, Kelly, you graduated from Russell Sage College. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, Alan, you came to Boston mm -hmm. University. How important truly was that educational experience in, in defining your lives? Well, I have the same story he has. I had a professor. I was a retailing, marketing, um, and journalism major. And I had a professor who took an interest in me and clearly knew that I was born to do advertising, sales, promotion, PR, special events. He insisted that I interview. And I took a junior summer and spent it on the junior executive training squad at Abraham and Strauss, which was the big flagship store of Federated Stores way back in the late 60s. And it changed my life. I met Alan. Um, I discovered what I really loved to do and what I was very good and born to do. And the rest is history. I've never worked a day in my life because I've loved every day of working. How wonderful. And Alan, you had a similar experience. I, I, had, I had a similar experience. B, B was a different school when I went there, but I had uh, you know, obviously many, many different professors that give you a broad understanding of business. I had an elective, which was retailing at the time, which we don't even, I don't think we even offer a retail course, uh, uh, purely retail course at BU today. Or at least we had stopped. But anyway, the professor was a fellow by the name of Professor Beckwith. I can see his face today. He's since passed away. He ha had a very stimulating class. He in interfaced with the students very well, and he would argue with them, and he liked you if you argued. And I would always be arguing with him. But he was really accommodating like that. He wanted you to argue with him. And he uh, used to say to me, you've got to go into retailing. I, I have no interest in retailing. So I got into retailing because of him, because he literally called up and made appointments for me to go see various retailers, one in Boston and two in, in New York. And secondly, I, I met my wife there. So I, one, I stayed in retailing all my life because of him and his introduction to me. And by the way, my class in retailing, when I would, went to Abraham and Strauss, I was on the training program, only on because he called to make a data. They didn't even have an opening. They made an accommodation for me. But because of my because background, of because of my, because of Alan, but because of my background in his class, I knew more of the jargon of retailing than any of the other students in the class. So I stood up. You had a leg up, yeah. And then because of that class, I was, I was put on the uh, assistant to the executive vice president, the number one retail person. And so that's how, that's how BU was to me. Yeah. It got me, one, interested in business. It got me into the retail world. And it got me into my marriage. <laughs> so that's pretty that's good. That's a trifecta. And it worked for, it worked for 50 yeah. years in retailing and 50, uh, 49 years as a married. How phenomenal. And it, so took you off the snow, it took you off the ski slope, too. It, well, it did. Until, until yeah. my 40th birthday. And then I went on a, a sabbatical for a year. <laughs> that is fantastic. Now, uh, you've chosen in your philanthropic efforts to focus on the arts and on education. Mm -hmm. uh, how did this come to be for you as, in areas of focus? Well, with me, I, I was born with uh, a visual, artistic, and design sense, and it was just a gift. And uh, when I got out of college, I went to the Whitney Museum. I went to New York to work, and on weekends, I would go to the Whitney Museum, and I uh, met a couple of the curators. Um, and with no art appreciation classes at all, I was never a student of the arts. But because I played the guitar, I, I liked performing. I earned my way through college playing the guitar and singing and liked art. I got to talking to them, and they said, what do you know about teaching? And I said, well, I'm salesmanship, marketing, sales, presentation. That's what I'm schooled in. And I found they let me um, manage uh, y young children in classes who had many have never been in a museum before. So I was really, really very good at letting them understand how to look, how to see, how to express themselves. These are all things I knew how to do. And as a special events producer and a marketing person, I simply knew how to get them all to be evocative. And kids do that pretty naturally if they're given a chance. And then I learned the atmosphere of museums. And I saw the educational value of a museum. And Alan and I today uh, endow education programs at the Whitney Museum, the Dallas Museum of Art, and the Aspen Museum of Art. 
So the threat of education throughout it's your all philanthropy education. is very, very powerful, exactly. whether it be in the arts exactly. or whether it be... And we're not teaching kids how to draw or paint. Mm -hmm. We're teaching mm -hmm. kids how to look, to see, to express themselves, or to think outside the square. Yeah. That's basically yeah. what we're all about. And they can take that to any career they go into. There's nothing like creativity and risk-taking. Exactly right. Now, innovation, as we say. Innovation. Biggest business success. You both have had remarkable successes in your careers. What would you describe as your biggest business success? Why don't we start with you, Alan? You know, I, I would say getting into, into retailing was my number one success. But two, I, I liked every one of the jobs I had. And I really, and I didn't um, see having a career in one place. I liked the idea of turning around a problem business. And so I enjoyed each one of them, and each one of them brought a different dimension. I met different people. I lived in different parts of the country. So I, it was just a total lack of uh, the, the business that I really enjoyed. And I, I, I love going to work. I used to go to work very early in the morning, come back very late, but I like doing it. I also want to make one comment on, on uh, philanthropy that to follow up on hers, I got involved in BU on the board, but I also felt very indebted to the, to the school. And Kelly and I have always given about 20% of our income uh, each year to charity. And so we sometimes don't always give it that year, but that's kind of what we've allocated out. Uh, and, and BU was something I felt very strongly about, but you and, and uh, Dr. Brown, really when we were doing the campaign, said, we, you know, we really want to do something at, at, at the school. And it was actually your, your idea is to, is to have the naming situation. That was not something I was thinking, but I had been thinking with my financial advisors, what would be the best way to, to uh, give to, to Boston University? And we had come up in our own mind is, how are we going to improve the, the school? Because the number one thing for me is to make sure that Boston University continues to be a great school and to continues to grow in terms of its stature. And when I came to uh, you and, during the campaign and Bob, uh, I told you what our, we, our thinking was and how we would look at this over a 10-year 10 10 year period. And one was you wanted to name the school what was going to be the thing you wanted to use the money for. And it one came back as having, having quality professors and finding the best professors is going to enlighten, is going to enhance the school. And the second one was really to find out uh, how to get smaller classes. Now, we all know BU is not self-sufficient in our endowment. We have a relatively small endowment. It's gotten twice as big as it was, but it's still small in comparison. So we have to find a way if we want to, if we want to uh, uh, endow professors or if we want to bring in scholarship, because schools are expensive. And so those are the things that we want to make a better school. We also want to make it more affordable. So there's two things, professors and doing scholarship. So that's things how we look at down the road. And it's based on how well does BU, BU the business school do going forward, and based on that, we, we've, we'll, we're going to be allocating more money based on the, the accomplishments of the school. But we want it to continue to grow. We don't want it to stay, and I, this was your mission, and you were the inspiration on that as well as Dr. Brown. Well, well thank you both for your remarkable generosity. Uh, we have momentum here, and our commitment is to make you proud. Well, uh, and that's an everyday mission we have, mm -hmm. starting with me and with our faculty, our staff, and our students, as you know. And, and I, think that, I think that the, the proud is, is about, as we talked with some of the students, about how much they feel connected to the, the, the staff. Feel it. The staff, the professors, they really feel interconnected. Like, no, like no school I've seen. And, and you know, a school, a great school, is really about the great professors and the leadership of the school. They make a great school, and then that attracts the best students. Yeah. So back to your career, you said, you know, I've had every job I've loved, uh, work has been love, and I can't pick one. Uh, Kelly, uh, I know you had an experience with a, a gentleman, an icon in fashion named oh, uh, yes. Ralph Lauren. Right. Uh -huh. would, would, there be Ralph any, Lauren. Uh -huh. would there be any linkage uh, in terms of your favorite business accomplishment beyond connecting with Alan. Well, uh, obviously, uh, meeting Ralph Lauren, I was an editor um, for a Condé Nast magazine at the time, Mademoiselle, which shortly thereafter 
became a part of Vogue. And I met him at one of his shows. And I happened to be standing there wearing a polo Ralph Lauren men's shaker sweater and a pair of trousers that Alan had given me. And I'd had them waist taken in with big pleats because you couldn't buy haberdashery, men's wear, for women in those days. And I loved that tailored look with sexy high heels and a sexy belt and a fedora. And, and I was standing there also, it was winter, with the lining, the camel melton wool lining of Alan's Burberry raincoat. And it's very stylish because the raglan sleeve, it could go, be worn over a huge sweater. And it had button holes on each side, but no buttons. So the eccentricity of that today, fashion world is demonstrating all the time. But that was unique in those days. And when I went onto the stage to shake hands with Mr. Lauren, he looked at me and he said, who are you? I was new at the magazine, and we hadn't met. And I said, I'm Kelly Questrom. And he said, are you related to Alan Questrom? And I said, yes, I am. I'm his wife. And uh, he said, well, what are you wearing? And I said, oh, Mr. Lauren, most of these clothes are yours. I've borrowed them from Alan. And he says to me, you know, I've always wanted to do a women's line. His men's line was very successful at that point. And he wanted to dress women in the tailored clothes, which he later designed for the Annie Hall movie, the Woody Allen movie. And he was fond of saying, the first woman who looked like Annie Hall when I met her was Kelly Questrom. Wow. So he, we, I went yeah. to work for him ultimately doing marketing for the women's line, which was a, a thrill. But I would say probably the greatest achievement in our life together in terms of business for me mm -hmm. is the business of reinventing myself because we moved a, a total of 12 times as Alan was constantly mm -hmm. turning a company around, then moving to the next troubled company, turning that company around, we'd move again. And I had to find a new job, uh, you know, reposition my career, and also find out what it was like to become a full partner with my husband, helping Learning him. new friends, learn, yeah. not, not easy when yeah, you move up. Easy for the business time. person, but not so much Doing for all the civic involvement that a department store CEO was expected mm -hmm. to do. And he didn't have time for, so it would fall to me. And I was just natural at that. I really loved working in the public and private sector, so I got to do both. Remarkable. Just remarkable. Yeah. Let's turn to the retail world and fashion now. Uh, Today's world, is, it's a lot of change going mm -hmm. on, and certainly mm -hmm. in these days for retail, it's any time, any place. Uh, the Internet's mm -hmm. being, becoming more and more prominent. As you think about, based on your experiences in retail, are there aspects of retail that you th think won't change in the future? Where you know, I, I think everything changes. You know, when I, when I started, it, every, every town had its own department store, and there were th a thousand department stores around the country, and some towns had three, four department stores. Today it's down to three major chains, with Macy's being twice, three times anything, anybody else. So that's changed. But when I was starting in the business, this is 1965, we, we were celebrating my department store, Abraham's, was 100th anniversary. That was in 1965. At three years old at that time was Walmart, Kmart, and Target. You know, Walmart today is the largest retail around, well over $500 billion. Department stores totally don't do $50, $60 billion today. And Target is also, and so that's, that's been a big change. Now you have the internet, and then you have off, offline. We didn't even have a mall back then, so malls changed it. Malls created competition for the department stores. Department stores dominated the business, but then the mall created a place for specialty stores to start up and be chains of specialty stores, which gave them buying clout that they wouldn't have in a small town. So it's always changing, and the challenge for any retailer is your job is to find out what the customer wants, and you have to adapt to it. Not different being in the auto industry. You've got to adapt to what the customer wants. You've got to be constantly coming up with new ideas. Most of the things we sell you don't have to have. So if you don't create a need for something, People don't buy, buy it, it. and yeah. so and that's the same in the auto. You don't need a car every three years, but you keep changing the car design. You keep coming up with new ways. People come up with a way. It's like the iPhone. Do you think you need an iPhone every six months? But they keep coming out with them. We're up to now what six or seven, and it's oh, only yeah. eight years old. And counting, yeah. yeah. So so that's what I think. The retail. So maybe so maybe knowing the customer and adapting to their always needs changing. will all. But the customer will always be at the, the same. Customer is the dictator of yeah. change. Yeah. And that's true business, by the way. Yeah. As you think about leaders for the future in a world where there's constant change, do you think that the, the essentials for a person to be an effective leader moving forward will be similar to what 
you've put together in, in your remarkable careers as leaders? Well, I think Alan is a, that kind of leader that's needed, a listener, a looker, highly curious, highly innovative, willing to try new things, but not first without focusing on it and doing the research that's necessary to see if it fits within the culture, if he understands the culture well enough to make those changes. And I think he's an enormously successful people person. Now today, the challenge is technology makes it so difficult for us to stay present and involved with each other, one human being with another human being, because we're all different, we're all intricate, and we're all changing. And so the challenge to a leader is to stay up with those differences mm -hmm. and that constant change. And if you're more involved in yourself and your computer, you're not actually interfacing with the dynam dynamic quality of humanism. That's a huge, huge problem. We find kids today who can't write or express themselves because they've been doing this mm -hmm. too much. Mm -hmm. And they have none of those outward, um, uh, other oriented uh, gifts that you have to have, the tools you have to have. So the dynamic of being able to engage, person yeah, to person, I would, I would human say, to human. Yeah, I would say the, the engagement is always an important thing. As a, you know, you, you, the millennial has been, and I don't mean this as a negative, but they have, they've grown up with technology that we didn't even know existed. And, and they spend a lot of time communicating back and forth. And the key thing is that, that is they gotta learn how to make sure it's focused, it's not all over the board, because it can be all over the board. And it's successful business people, successful schools, learn how to focus on the key things that are important today, and constantly looking for what needs to be next. But you can't do everything. You gotta be able to learn how to focus. And I think one of my successes is that I was always very focused. I always had a strategy. I always was very focused about that strategy. And I was very good at communicating to the team mm -hmm. what needed to be done. The team makes it successful. But you have to be the one who focuses it down. You have to be able to edit it down and say, this is our strategy, and get them to be their, their strategy. Because you don't be you. It's, it's not about just you. It's about the professors all thinking, it's my, it's my store. It's my school. Yes. And when it's their school or their store, that usually is going to be successful. Are there great leaders that you've thought about as you've gone through your careers where you said, here's one or two leaders, whether in history right. or that you might have worked with, where you said, I wanna, I wanna emulate many aspects of, of that person and their leadership approach. Have there been people yeah, such I, as that, and who might they have been? Well, I think there's a lot of different people. I was fortunate to work in, at the time, was the best in the industry, <clears throat> so it attracted the best people. Yeah. I was always very aware of what worked and what didn't work for different people. I'm also aware of you know politicians, what works and what doesn't work for them. And in fact, the the, the thing on my de the, the the on my desk, which is you know you, you don't care, you can do anything you want, so you don't care who gets credit for it. That actually came from Reagan. Mm -hmm. But it's a, something that's really about what a business is all about. A business isn't one person; it's multiple people. It's op often, and it's not all about you. And it's all no all matter about if you. you do have your your advanced degree. Yeah. yeah, and entrepreneurs, however, tend to be the creators, mm -hmm. but they also don't generally have the ability to manage big businesses because it's all about their skill set, mm -hmm. and I think it's very difficult for them to delegate, including Steve Jobs, who built yeah. the biggest and most successful business in the world. He was a very creative guy, but he had to do it had to be his way of doing it, mm -hmm. and that doesn't generally work in big businesses. It strikes me, Alan and Kelly, that listening is a very important part of what you do and, and your formula for success. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, you ask what I have learned from business and living with Alan, who is a consummate communicator, a consummate listener, a consummate observer. Uh, he'll talk to anyone in the business or other people's businesses mm -hmm. and get mm -hmm. them to talk to him. And getting that confidence going informs him and also teaches him who's trustworthy and who isn't, who's got integrity and who doesn't. Because a lot of the human resource decisions have to be made knowing that you need a trustworthy person, you need an integritous person, a person who, who has those uh, human virtues. And living with him has made me a much better listener although he'll say I talk more than I listen, and he's right about that. But <laughs> it, it has made me a better listener. It's always also made me a much better executive because I grew up as a, as a writer and a, and a planner and a creative director in a rather solitary position where I really wasn't working with a huge team. There'd be four or five people on my creative team, but not an entire store group as he would be. 
but I, I learned from him and to the point where I now, I've, I've built, renovated, or restored 12 of our homes. I can work with an entire group of subcontractors, appreciating all of them, getting to know them all, feeling their, the synergy of us working together. I can do um, creative work for mayors. I've worked for a uh, New York mayor. I've worked, uh, worked for the Atlanta mayor, Andrew Young at the time, when we lived in Atlanta. It has allowed me to work as a teammate even though I'm sort of one-brained, being a creative-oriented person, I'm not a natural manager of people, but I have just got it from him osmotically. So it's doable. Yeah. As you look to the future, uh, and we look to the future, the future really lies in the hands of our students. They'll yep. soon be graduating, going out into the world, striving to make a difference. Mm -hmm. if, if you had a, a word of advice, each of you, uh, for these soon-to-be graduates, uh, based on your wisdom, your experience, what would that, what would the advice be that Very you have simple. to share with them? Find something you love doing. Make sure if you don't find something you love doing, you'll think it's work. <laughs> and I love what I did, and I love going to work, and I, it didn't bother me what time I went. When I hear somebody say, oh boy, I'm glad it's Friday, to me I'm saying, you better find another job. But when you find something you love, you, you will be very good at it. And when you get to be 65, you'll look back and say, what a great life that was. And that's happened to me. I wouldn't do it any differently. But you know, I, to me, work is not something you dread. You have to like doing it. And there's so many jobs totally. you can find, but you've got to, be, you've got to invest yourself into it in order to get back. Uh, and I, I, I just uh, was very fortunate. But I think I, if I went into the auto industry, I'd find that exciting too. I mean, to me, would just be, that would be a challenge. So find your passion and invest yourself in it, yep. uh, your whole person, if you will, in Absolutely. all aspects. Absolutely. Kelly? Well, we who are in the sales business, no matter what you sell, and all of us are selling something, a, a service or a, or a product, um, know the customer's always right. Except when you've given up on your own integrity or your own virtues or your, uh, your own sense of, of balance. Mm -hmm. And you have to keep that in mind. You have to always know when you're conning yourself, when you're not looking at the big picture. I mean, you have to always know when you've got too much ego invested in something and not enough clarity and presence. So it's a, it's a personal bat, uh, battle to keep you, you. You've got your educational skills to back you up, but then there's always that, that concern about getting too much invested in personality or uh, prestige. Um, there's just uh, times when you have to rethink, step back, take yourself out of the equation, and look to see if you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing, mm -hmm. and if you're doing it um, for all the right reasons. So beware of yes. arrogance. Take mm -hmm. inventory of yourself. Matters. Take inventory of yourself on a regular basis. And strive to do the right thing. Always. Always. Yeah, integrity Always. integrity yeah. is a very important issue. Absolutely. In most cases, and I would say 90, 9% of people have it. They get it when, from their parents, uh, and, and, and they live with it, and parents correct you when you do something wrong. Uh, in, in my experience in business, I have found 99% of the time people are integritous. And by the way, if they're not in your company and you're the boss, you better make sure you do something about it because that sets the example. But you have to also do what you say. You, you, people, a lot of times people talk about integrity, but they may not be doing it themselves. Mm -hmm. But I must say, I, I have found that most businesses, that, despite what you read in the newspaper, most of the people I came asso that I was associated with, I, I don't ever remember a, a person, well, there were people, but there was something was done with them. But generally speaking, these were highly integrity, integritous people. Such an important way to end our conversation, mm -hmm. focused on integrity and character. It's so everything. essential. It is. No matter who you what are, a good by the education way, make a mistake, you'll go are. down yeah. with you. Yeah. <laughs> you'll never get rid of it. We've been in conversation with Alan and Kelly Questrom. Uh, thank you for joining us, and thank you, Alan and Kelly, for an inspirational conversation. Our pleasure. Thank you. Nice to be with you.